in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. So our title, as have been given the title last night, the characteristic of a leader. So just I will try to choose Moses as an example, and then we can discuss it together. So I'll start with you with a quote by Origen in his commentary on the Gospel of St. John. He says, no one has dared to give so pure revelation of the divinity of the Lord as John. While we are reading this quote, sometimes we are, when we are sharing few, few verses in, in, in a sermon or in a Bible study, we feel it's just we are filling a gap or we are discussing a topic so we need to put some verses beside each other. But for origin, he saw that what St. John has done and what we have in our church understanding is completely different. So no one has dared to give a so pure revelation of the divinity of the Lord as John. We must make bold to say the Gospels are the fulfillment of the whole Bible, and John's Gospel is the fulfillment of the Gospels. Why? Look at that. No one... Thank you. No one can grasp their meaning unless he has rested on Christ rest, the St. John, unless he has received Mary from Jesus so that she has become his mother too. So before we start, I need to find out where I'm standing. Am I standing or leaning on the chest of Christ? Do I see myself as the one who has been handed Virgin Mary as his mother? Then I can see how I can relate to each verse, either in the Gospel of St. John or the writing of St. John or any other writings. So, because we are choosing Moses as the one to be our example in leadership, this is Deuteronomy 34. Who wrote Deuteronomy 34? No. The only chapter is not written by Moses in the five books is Joshua, because this is the last chapter about Moses, or the, it includes the days of Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, why? Whom the Lord knew face to face. So again, when we encounter or we are searching for a leadership, we need someone to learn from him who is encountering a relationship with the Lord face to face. So I'll put just some titles and some verses and we can discuss it together. So I said at the beginning, recognizing God's hand in our lives. To be a good leader, it means I can see things differently. So I'm sharing with you Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1 to 4. And the man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she, should, she couldn't longer, no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, thou bit it with asphalt and pitch, but the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would be done to him. So, to be a good leader, it means I can see the hand of the Lord in my life from day one. Can you reflect in this verse? Do I see him in each and every step of my life? Or am I angry against him because I feel he left me to suffer at this age, at this stage in my life. That's why maybe I'm struggling to be a leader of my family now, a leader of in my work, place, or whatever I'm chosen to be a leader. So Moses from the beginning saw <clears throat> every single thing happened in his life was a divine plan. Definitely the devil was always trying to disturb this plan. But he saw even if there is a disturbance from the devil, the Lord is going to use it once more. St. Clement of Alexandria was trying to define the meaning of the goodness of God. What do you think? What is the goodness of God? How do you understand the goodness of God? When you say God is good, what does it mean? Good. God is good? Beautiful. Yani, what does it mean God is good? Good. Ikaman, what else? 
merciful. According to St. Clement of Alexandria, he's making a, a great difference. Why? But definitely, if I'm saying X or Y is good, he is doing good things. Or at least he's not doing bad things. But the goodness of God, according to St. Clement of Alexandria, is able to convert every evil, evil, every profanity, everything that is, looks very nasty and bad into something good. As if he is telling to each one of us, if you are regretting anything you have in your life, it's time to see that every single thing is in the hand of the mighty God, the good God, who is able to convert it into something good. Maybe I can see it right now. And I'm sure you discussed before many times the story of Joseph. How over 13 years, it seems there is nothing good. But he saw it differently. He saw that the Lord is doing something absolutely fantastic. In the end, he became the second man in Egypt. But if you go step by step, you can see that God has forsaken him. He has forgotten totally by God. And now it's time to be angry against God or to blame God. Why did you leave me in such thing? So I think the first step to be in the right direction like Moses did as a leader, he recognized how awesome God was despite all the afflictions he had. He was hated before he was born. It was not planned for him to be born. And after his birth, while he was three months, it was a time to throw him away, or at least to kill him. There was, those were, are the two options at the time. But he saw God's hand keeping him. Maybe you are here tonight, and you don't know how you came to this point. But I'm sure every one of us can find out a series of miraculous events that I'm here today or tonight because God has protected me. Yes, I was afflicted many times. I, I felt I was forsaken many times. But still, the mighty hand of God was preserving me and keeping me safe till today. One more thing. But sometimes when we think of leadership, we put some worldly figures. He is a great leader. But when the church is teaching us our leadership, it's something totally different. Sometimes it looks opposite to the world. Some, uh, some other times it looks quite similar. But the majority of the mindset of the Word of God is not appealing <coughs> or not equivalent to what we hear always in the world. So sometimes I'm making my own directions and I'm pursuing it harshly. I'm not looking to anyone. I'm not listening to anyone. I'm not listening even to God, but I have chosen my own way. But Moses never did so. He did at the beginning of his life and he recognized it was wrong. You go back <coughs> to Acts chapter 7, you will hear how by his own choice he chose to kill the Egyptian. And it was amazing for him he was lost in the desert or disciplined in the desert for 40 years. But here in this time was totally different. After he listened to the Lord, after at this 40 years, second thing, when God calls, we need to listen. So in Exodus chapter 3, after he saw the burning bush, then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, God called to him from the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. So sometimes we took our leadership from our minds and we lose everything. Unfortunately, in the end, we blame God. Why you have left me to take such a decision? But he's telling you from the beginning, you have the free will. You have the choice either to listen to me, to take my guidance, or to follow your own desires and to call it divine. So. From the beginning, Moses learned from his mistake. So a leader, it doesn't mean that you are perfect or sinless, but someone who is able to learn from his mistakes. And once he learned, it's time to tell him, I am here. We'll see in a moment how he saw himself very disqualified for the mission to deliver the whole Israelites from Egypt. 
the world is saying, are you fit for it? Are you able to make it? And then he can tell you, before you go to the interview, sell yourself properly. Show how great you are. But here the leader was totally different. The leader saw himself very weak, not able to make it. Then he did a great mission, and he showed a, me a real meaning of leadership, that God can lead me if I will surrender. If I will tell him, here I am. So when we think of Moses as a leader from the beginning, God is asking you and me, would you like to be a leader according to my own heart? Or according to your own divine or non-divine plan? He's telling me and you, it's time to see whom you are following. Are you following him wholeheartedly or following your own plans in your mind? Would you please elaborate more about like to submit your heart to God? So yes. like it. Yes. I don't have a Bible. Can you can you open it if you have a Bible? Open uh, Colossians one nine. Colossians 1 9. Okay, St. Paul. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. So, when I seek to be, in, to be filled with the knowledge of his will, then I will do his will, not my will. There's nothing wrong to be ambitious and to have your own plans. But are you going to put your plans before him to choose for me or not? So he has a first plan. Moses has a first plan. I'm going to kill the Egyptian. I am the, sec uh, I'm the second man in Egypt. But next day, he felt it was not right. And he fled. So there is nothing wrong to have my plan, but I have to always test it. Am I filled with the knowledge of his will? Or not yet. Otherwise, I am fulfilling my own desire, not seeking him in person. Okay. Ready to forsake anything at any time. What does it mean? You go to Hebrews, the very famous chapter 11 of faith. By faith, Moses, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, steeping the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, where he looked to the reward. If you ask that yourself, you are in the same position, thinking of two things, to stay as a second man or the son of the daughter of Pharaoh, or to be in this miserable 40 years in the wilderness, and then later to be facing the Pharaoh and the whole chariots of Pharaoh. Which one we can choose? For a wise leader in this world, he will stay in the palace of Pharaoh. But for someone who said to the Lord at one point, here I am, he will never do it. And I think it's the challenge of every one of us, anywhere at any time. Always there is two choices. You go back, to 2 Samuel chapter 19, you'll find the Lord is presenting it in a very nice way. There's two kings in the story. You remember when Absalom, the son of David, rebelled against his father? You remember the story? Then a guy called Itai followed King David and there was a choice. David told him, it says, and the king told Itai, go back and stay with the king. So the verse, verse 19, was showing us two different kings. But one of them was, was a real king, but he was not enthroned. Other one was a false king, but unfortunately he was enthroned. He became the king of Israel. And then the choice, which one are you going to choose? Moses chose the one who is not enthroned. The one whom he told him, here I am, Lord. I'm ready to be in full obedience to your desire. So when he was able to forsake anything at any time, it ends up he became 
the real man of God, the real leader who is able to take around two million people in a journey without any provisions, was not taking any food, has no maps or compass, but he was following the Lord. In many occasions, we are looking for a full plan before we move, to go anywhere. But he was showing us the leader who is according to the heart of God, he is following God wherever he is directing him. But still, because we, are, we can easily say, we are, but we are living in the 21st century. We need a detailed full plan, then I will start moving. That's why we are not moving. But once we are in this direction, say, telling him, here I am, here I stand, as Isaiah was telling him, send me, O Lord, in Isaiah chapter 6, it became something totally different. I believe he's asking me and you this evening, what is the thing that you don't want to forsake it? That's why your leadership is in danger, whether at home, at work, in the church, wherever you, 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 are, you, are, you are serving. There is something I have to forsake. Uh, am I ready to forsake anything at any time? It means I'm in the right direction. It means I'm going to be a, a good tool in his hand to be used for his glory as a leader, wherever I'm going to be. One more thing regarding the word. If we read a few verses, we are trying to find out how to be a leader. But again, origin in his commentary in Proverbs is telling us is always a secret in the verse. It's not a matter of do I understand every word in Hebrew or in Greek or no, there is a secret. And even this secret is not for everyone and it differs from one to another. So he's telling us, if you try to reduce the divine meaning to the purely external signification of the words, the word will have no reason to come down to you. You know, you can read by your own eyes, but there's still the secret is hidden. It will return to its secret dwelling, which is contemplation that is worthy of it. I read the chapter and I got nothing. I heard the verse hundreds of times, but it means nothing for me. Or I know what does it mean, but you know, know it without its secret. Or it has wings, this divine meaning, given to it by the Holy Spirit, who is its guide. That's why we ask ourselves, do, did we pray before we read the word of God that we are going to be in this secret dwellings, not to allow it to come and go back as it is? In Exodus, we know the story of the 10 plagues. Again, there was a leader, but this leader is showing us if you accept the secrets of the divine revelation as Origin was telling us. After each plague, there was always a discussion between Moses and uh, Moses and Aaron from one side and Pharaoh from the other side. So in chapter 8, the message from the beginning, from chapter 5, let my people go to do what? Yes. No. <laughs> it is mentioned nine times in the book of Exodus. Eight of them, let my people go to worship me. The first one, it was not. Let my people go to feast for me in the wilderness. So to go out, to be in his presence is a feast. Worship is a feast. But here, four compromises, he tried to, to do it with them. So again, as a leader, he refused to compromise. Despite some of them looks not bad. At least we're going to, to go out. So the first one in Exodus 8.25, go ye sacrifice to your God in the land. Stay here in Egypt and go and sacrifice. Why do you want to go away? If the Lord tells them, let my people go to sacrifice or to feast, why are not willing to feast in this land? It looks a fair request. Worship your, we will build church wherever you want. We will build a place of worship wherever you want. But he didn't feel this is what God has told me. Second time, only you shall not go very far. Okay, go out, but not very far. Are you ready to compromise? 
Well, to anyone who compromised this fight, it was a king, a real king, a real leader. I have three kings in the history of Israel. King Manasseh, his son is King Amun, and his son is King Josiah. King Manasseh was a king for 55 years. He was not worshiping God. At the very end, he repented, kind of half repented. So what did he do? He decided to take all the idols from the altar and to put it at the gate of the city. Then he died. The son Amun was a king only for two years. The first thing he did, he brought back all the idols and worshipped them. Despite his father looks like someone, I'm not bad. I'm going to take them away just at the gate of the, of the, of the city. Then Josiah came, and what he did is he grinded the idols, not only take them out. And he was showing that there is no time to compromise. It's not about not very far. It's either in it or out of it. So Moses was seeing it. I cannot be in it by any means. The most amazing part of the story of the three kings, Manasseh, uh, Amun and Josiah at that time was the priests. Why? The same priests who were ordered to worship the idols in the, in the temple during the time of Nasa, those who uh, were ordered to take them out of the city. The same people who bring it back into the temple at the time of Amun. But they are not the same people who take it off at the time of Josiah. So I said, it is not working anymore. If your heart is still between whatever you are going to tell me, I will do it, and you are ignoring the word of God, then you cannot serve the Lord anymore. You cannot be a leader. That's why Josiah, according to the word of God, he is the best king in the history of Judah after King David. Why? Because he worshiped God wholeheartedly. Third time, go now, ye that are men but not your little ones okay i accept you to go far but your kids no as far as you are saying we are going to worship and come back and still the answer of moses and aaron no sometimes we do it when we are saying that we are the leaders of whatever we are but we are ready to sacrifice some people we feel they are not important enough. So I'm focusing on the important people in my Sunday school class, in my family or whatever it is. So I'm not bad, I'm doing a good job. At least I get five out of eight or out of 10 or whatever it is. Moses said, no, everyone has to go out. And again, he's telling me, as a leader, are you going to compromise with either part of your own salvation or salvation of anyone who is around you. Your Christ and John Christom, we are not worthy of life if we are not keen on salvation of everyone. And then there is a fourth good offer. Yes. By all means, you know, even at work or wherever you are, if you received a clear instructions, I would take it as it is or you are going to compromise in a way that you feel more comfortable, pleasing some more people, not only my boss, not only God. Context, I think, just to finding, to compromise, like if you're a leader, you gotta compromise anyways. Like how come you're, okay. leader, you're living with? Yes, Moses was ready, spectrum. yes, you will see it in a moment. He was ready to compromise in something not divine. He got the advice from his father-in-law who was a pagan worshiper. But the advice was good and God told him do it. But now you are compromising with what God has told you. Go all of you, not leave your kids, not leave your wives, not leave anything as a first uh, compromise. Go only let your flocks and herds be stayed. It's good enough. You will go, but leave your Look, will you accept or not? Many times the Bible is assuring us, if you remember the story in 
first Samuel chapter 26 to chapter 30 when it's the same story of Absalom when he was reigning as a king and before it as well when uh, Saul was following King David again first Samuel chapter 26 to chapter 9 so King Saul was following him so David fled and after he fled he went to the king of Gath and he was seeking refuge with the enemies and the time has come that this king was about to fight against King Saul he accepted to go with the king of Gath against King Saul despite just few chapters before he said he was able to kill him he refused that I will not touch the the anointed one but now everything has been changed so he tried to go but the leaders of King of God refused said he is going to be against us during the war he is the man who killed Goliath God is part of Palestine so they knew the story of Goliath and David at the very end they went back after they went back to the place where they have camped with their families he found that the enemies, the Amalekites, took everything. And the Bible was telling us in chapter 30 that he was the first time after one year and four months to pray. Why? Because even the people, the men who were with him, were about to stone him. Why you allow this to happen to our kids and to our uh, wives? Then the Lord spoke to him and told him, go and pursue them and you'll return everything. The Bible verse 13 tells us clearly, he restored everything. He didn't lose anything, either young or old, animals or children. The Lord has restored everything and he has given him a spoil and it was said, this is the spoil of David. So he was not ready to compromise and God is ready to restore everything if you are willing to pursue everything but if from the beginning he can say okay we'll go and bring our wives and our kids it doesn't matter if you bring back our flocks or not but here he's telling us Moses in the four request to compromise he refused and he's asking me in your own leadership are you are you ready to refuse any compromise or not why? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't get that in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14. Holiness without which no one can see the Lord. But everyone is doing it. Everyone is saying it's normal. It's common. It's not common anymore. Why? Because God had say, he said it's right or it's wrong. So he's asking me, in your own leadership, whether spiritual leadership or any kind of leadership, when you compromise, are you compromising with the commandments of the Lord or com compromising with something else? We are not saying be any uh, closed-minded, no. But with our personal sanctification, there is no way. Unfortunately, in many occasions, we refuse to listen out, be holy because I am holy. Be nice is enough, but don't be holy. There's nothing in the Bible saying be nice. Let's be holy because I am holy. Be perfect because your Father in heaven is perfect. And here there is no compromise. That's why Moses as a leader is telling us I'm not going to compromise. Even it looks nice. It's better than nothing. No, it's not better than If he's telling me this is your task or target, I will pursue what the Lord is telling me. I just want to address the point. Um, uh, I want to use the word flexibility uh, as, a, as opposed to compromise when it comes to actual real life situations at work. There will be items in our lives and at work that are not negotiable, like what uh, Moses did. They are not negotiable. So, and, and, and we have to deal with them with heavenly uh, wisdom and spirit of discernment and, and pray that the Lord will put the right words at the right time and everything but there is a level of flexibility for items that are not really compromising our faith or our our uh, our values in, in 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 christian life so i would use the word flexibility but not a compromise 
you know, exactly like uh, St. John the Baptist. You know, at the time of, of Jesus, at least it was between around uh, 12,000 priests and Levites. One of them was St. John the Baptist. So he was not the only one. But he insisted to say that truth. Despite he knew it would cost him his life. It's easy to tell him, say it once and stop it. Or say it many times as you want, but not in the ears of the king. Be wise. I'm not going to be in this direction. I know it will cost me my life, but I am proud to do it. I'm not lazy to do it. I'm not going to compromise with it. It's good to preach about St. John the Baptist. But the most important thing is to live the life of St. John the Baptist. We heard about the truth a lot of times. It's time to see that the truth, when he dwells in me, the truth became a person, not a knowledge or a verse. It's a person living in me, uniting myself with him in each and every Eucharist to give me the courage and the power to be able to do it to the last place. We heard many times about the martyrs of Libya or the martyrs of St. Samuel the Confessor they were asked. It's very easy to say, why didn't deny Christ for just for a few moments and then we can confess it again? He said, no, we are not going to compromise. Because the Lord himself said, if you deny me before men, I will deny you before my Father in heaven. That's why Moses was pursuing the truth and he was very clear with his adversity. One of the characteristics of Moses again Persistence in the face of the adversity. So Moses and Aaron were brought again to Pharaoh. He's not standing before a friend. He is the first man in Egypt who was at that time one of the greatest kings or leaders in the world. And he said to them, Go serve the Lord your God, who are the ones that are going. And Moses said, We will go with our young and old, our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds. We will go, for we must hold a feast to the Lord. It's easy to tell him, don't say it in front of the of Pharaoh. Do it, but be nice when you are talking to him. It was not nice. It was very clear. That's why he's, he's telling us in, 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 in a very nice way and firm way as well. It's time to find out your own way. What are you doing in your workplace? in your service, in your family, everywhere. So Moses as a leader was showing that we are not afraid of the enemy. You go to Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15, he was telling us clearly that the enemy has been totally disarmed. The enemy has been defeated on the cross. It's time to claim and to enjoy your victory. If you are still afraid of him, if you are still not living the power of his resurrection, means that truth is not clear inside your heart and in your mind. But in every time when we come to church, when we attend the liturgy, when we attend the Bible study, the truth is instilling hope in me, changing and converting my fear into courage, my sinful nature into a holy one. Why? Because I'm pursuing the truth as a person and as a knowledge in the Word of God. Humility. In Exodus 4, 10, because it's very easy to say you have to be good enough in presenting yourself, which is okay. But do you see your weakness before you go for it? Or I'm bold enough, I'm able to make it because I'm good at this, whatever it is. Moses saw his weakness after he was bold enough to kill 40 years ago. Then God said, this is my leader. This man, I can use him. Because he knew he's weak, and he will rely on my own strength and power. The world is telling us to the opposite. Be strong, be yeah, able to convince everyone with whatever you want to do, and then you are in the right position. No, it is totally the opposite. Twice, said in 3.6, Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. He knows he is in the presence of the awesome God. It's easy now to blame God and to raise our eyes to him. What are you doing? You have forsaken me. 
you don't know what you are doing because you left this person to, to live and this person died. Or this person is successful and this other one is not successful. Moses was showing us, yes, I learned the lesson. I know I cannot face him in such an awesome presence. Then immediately in chapter 4, Oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, nor since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am a slow of speech and of <clears throat> a slow tongue. He knew his weakness, but he was able to be in full surrender to the will of God. That's why later he told him, here I am. What do you want me to do? So to be a leader, it means I know my weakness. I'm not proud of my intelligence. I'm not proud of my own skills, which again against the mentality of the world. But I'm in full assurance that he is able to use me to perform his task with no skills. I'm not eloquent and speak, slow of speech and slow. I have a slow tongue. Again, if you are in this position, if you can see yourself properly in need of his power, he is able to make you a good leader at home, at work, church, wherever you are. That's why when we think of the humility of Moses, we see the reality of what Jesus did on the cross. As one of the church fathers said, if we summarize the whole story of salvation, it starts with two sins, pride, which led disobedience the co normal consequence is they are kicked out of paradise this came he did it upside down even full humility full obedience obedience across as saint paul says in philippians 2 7 and 8 which leads to restoration of our paradise so it looks very simple and very hard in the same time Simple if we recognize humility and obedience are the keys. Very hard if we feel I cannot be humble in, before this person or this in this situation. I feel obedience is something costly. Yes, it's costly. To the point of this, this to the cross. Are you able to humble yourself? The next verse, verse 9 and 10. And Paul is telling us, that's why the Lord God has lifted him up and gave him a name above all other names. When we think of obedience and humility field, they will swallow me in this world. So it's the, the, the good option for me is hit him hard or hit her hard. But the reality is humble yourself. Go and wash their feet. And the Lord wanted to elevate us all into the heaven realms. What he did, he started on washing their feet. Immediately he went to the cross then he was able to lift us all up. When we feel on the, when we think in the opposite direction, we lose it. Yes, I have my own pride. Even sometimes we say it in the, at schools, for God's sake, have some pride. What sort of pride are you looking for? For God's sake, have some humility and obtain the mind of Christ. And Paul Birkeda in Philippians 2.5, he was willing and praying that all of us has this mind of God mind of Christ, the mind of humility. First Corinthians 2.16, he's repeating the same, but we, who are we? Those who choose willingly to follow Christ, we have the mind of Christ. So, yes. Yeah. Moses says, Pardon your servant, Lord, please send someone else. And then 14, the Lord's anger burned against Moses and said, What about your brother Aaron? So Moses was making a lot of excuses, right? Yes. So is that an example of humility or just yes, cowardliness? I, I need to ask myself yeah. one question. Is it really what I feel or I'm pretending that I don't have it? If it's really what you feel, it's not excuse. It might look an excuse, but for me it's real. I'm not trying to, to show that I'm a, a humble person. In the end, he said it many times in Exodus and later in Deuteronomy. If your glory is, or if your face is not going before us, 
We will not go. So now I rely. I know I am weak and you have chosen me. Then lead me step by step and I'm going to go. But if your face is not before me, leading me to the way, I will never go, I will never move. Okay. But there's nothing wrong to show my real humility. You know, why now we have, when we see the ordination of a bishop or the pope, find two bishops holding his hands. What do you think, why? Yes, they used to flee and to hide themselves. So now it's not anymore, but <laughs> they are trying to tell them, you are in this, I feel I'm not worthy of it. That's why we are holding him in heart. Them, you are going to be our bishop or our pope or whatever it is. So it's out of humility, Mish. It's an action. Let us pretend that I am, I am humble. And now I will see what you are going to do. No. The church is telling us, when you humble yourself in reality, then you receive a real power. You can pretend, but you receive nothing. And you will remain in this situation. Yes, Kiv. Take it. Yes. yes. There's the most important part of the humility because it's not low self-esteem. There's a big difference. Low self-esteem, I am bad, I am not fit for it, I can't do anything. But humility, I know that I have this humble status, but I am accepting as part of my humility this power to be mine. Then I agree something totally different. When we see any story, in the church history or in the Old Testament or the New Testament, we see a person showing his weakness. Then he accepted the fullness of the power of God. But just to have a low self-esteem and to flee, God cannot use you because you reject his power. If I am humble, I know that I am nothing, but I will be the fragrance of Christ by accepting the power of the Holy Spirit. So one more thing out of the uh, PowerPoint. You think again of the life of Moses. If you imagine that at one point, God was telling him through your rod. And then it was converted into a serpent. And then he started to use it for the glory. The magicians of Egypt did ne nearly the same despite the, the serpent of Moses ate them all. God is telling me something very important. As a leader, will you use all what you have for my glory? Again, it was part of his humility. He said, you are not the Israelites are not going to believe me, what I have to do. And Pharaoh will not believe that um, I was sent from the true king, from the true God. He told him, use your rod, and do so and so. When he was doing this, do I believe that the little I have as a leader, if it is in the hand of the Lord, will be used for his glory to prove who he is and whom has sent me or no? It's more than that. St. Paul Ulkeda in Romans chapter 6 from verse 16 onward said, you have used your members as members of unrighteousness my eyes, my ears, my hands. He is saying now because you are in full obedience to Christ, use the same members to be tools in the hand of the Holy Spirit for righteousness. So how comes the same hand? And St. Paul was guarding the clothes of those who were stoning Peter. He accepted to be stoned three times, nearly to this point for the sake of Christ. He was grabbing people from church meetings and gatherings, Christians, to prisons, and to torture them to renounce their faith. He was using his the same hands to pray for everyone who was away from Christ to bring him back to Christ. So how come as a leader, maybe I used to be in a very sinful as a leader as well, it's time maybe I'm thinking how to convert back. How I can use my talents in a different way. Open one more verse. Uh, John 
John 3.6 Then it that which is born of the flesh is flesh and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Let us focus for a moment in this verse to find out what the Lord wants to tell us. If you imagine Christ and Paul was very much into this fire of the spirit ignorantly before knowing Christ to kill Christians. After he became a Christian, he had the same fire and zeal but to bring them back to the Lord, right? But if it is the same fire with the same directions, will it be accepted by God or not? The Lord here is telling us, sometimes we see an intelligent person and he is not a believer, for example. And now he is coming to church to be a believer. That's very nice. Would you like him to be stupid after becoming a believer? Definitely not. But he has to renounce his fleshly intelligence because it's out of the flesh. It should be reborn again, be born of the spirit. Because sometimes we come to Christ with our fleshly intelligence, our fleshly plans and designs. And we feel it was not right, wrong. So now I'm committing my life to Christ. Why do you want me to change something? Because it is of the flesh. It looks nice, but it's nice of the world. We need to be born again of the Spirit. Are you with me at this point? It looks hard, but again, if I have any positive thing in my personality before being a Christian or being committed to Christ, of course, when I come to Christ, it should remain, but it should die first because it's of the flesh. Be born again of the spirit, and it's part of our baptism if you are no believers, and it's part of our repentance if you are already believing and baptized before. That I'm trying to, to bury every single fleshly thing in my life to be born again to be of the spirit. Moses did the same. In after when he was in the house of Pharaoh, he was able to use his power to kill the Egyptian. But after 40 years, after he learned the lesson, now I still have a power, but I'm not going to use it this way. It should die to be of the spirit, and then I will listen to you to tell me what I can do with this power. More than that, uh, Joshua, when he went to spy the land, in the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 14, uh, and chapter 14, 13 and 14. Then the story has been repeated once more and the end of the story in Joshua chapter 14. He was telling them clearly before everyone, my strength now, it was 45 years elapsed. He went when he was 40 years old and now he is reporting when he is 85 years old. That my strength now is exactly the same as it was 45 years ago. But he is the only one among the Israelites who was mentioned many times. Of course, Joshua was with him. That the Lord mentioned six times in the book of Numbers and the book of Joshua and in the first chapter of Deuteronomy that he is the only one who followed the Lord wholeheartedly among the 600,000 of the Israelites. Of course, with Joshua. But the Lord was talking mainly about Caleb, how he followed wholeheartedly the Lord all the way, waiting for 45 years for, his, for the promise to be fulfilled in his life. One more thing in a good leader is dedication. And here he found himself, his, now he already passed the Red Sea. And the Lord, in chapter 18 in Exodus, Moses heeded the voice of his father-in-law and did all that he had said. He was a pagan person. But he felt that it is a wisdom from his father-in-law. 
And Moses chose able men out of all Israel and made them heads over the people, rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, rulers of fifties, and rulers of ten. So they judged the people at all times. The hard cases they brought to Moses, but they judged every small case themselves. So a good leader is able to delegate and to delegate to its fullness. Sometimes I'm delegating, but micro, yes, micro managing every single thing, as if still I'm doing everything. And I find myself not able to expand or to grow. Why? Because I'm still a limited person. Yes, I know that five or 10 people are working under my supervision, but I don't need to know the details of each and every one of them, because it will make my life miserable. And in the same time, it's not a delegation. I'm using someone to do what is in my mind. And he will never be creative. He will be always afraid of doing mistakes because I'm micromanaging every single step in his life. And here's something very important, spiritually and at all levels. When we use our roads, it becomes his. What does it mean? I will read with you two verses in chapter 4. So the Lord said to him, What is that in your hand? He said, A rod. And he said, Cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and became a serpent. And Moses fled from it. Then the Lord said to Moses, Reach out your hand and take it by the tail. It's a miracle. Fine. It said, No, rod of Moses. Chapter uh, same chapter, verse 20. Then Moses took his wife and his sons and set them on a donkey, and he returned to the land of Egypt, and Moses took the rod of God in his hand. It is still, it's my salary or it's my money. But when it is in my hand as a leader, it is the money of God. It's the rod of God. It's the time. He gave me 24 hours at the beginning of the day. It's the time of God. It's not my time anymore. That's why it's part of our new mentality. Everyone is called to be a leader, at least lead your life. It's not a matter of being a leader of big group or small group, lead your life properly. So everything I have belongs to the Lord. It's the road of God. And he's asking me and you again, you are able to lead yourself properly. You'll be a good husband or a good wife or a good whatever you are doing or whatever your profession. And then you are in the right direction. But as far as I feel, this is mine. God has nothing to do with my money. God has nothing to do with my work. God, God has nothing to do with whatever I am doing. Then there is something wrong. So he's telling me you are here to know that you need to rephrase your sentences. The Lord said in John chapter 3, verse 21, that their works might be seen as if they are done by God it's yes it's done by my own hands but this is the hand of God this is the eyes of God when we have the sacrament of confirmation we sanctify the body of a newly baptized person with 36 anointment to say now he became consecrated he became set apart for a divine purpose because now his eyes become the eyes of the Lord St. Paul said one time, how come that I will take the members of Christ and make them for adultery? You can't. Because they are not mine anymore. Another time in First Corinthians chapter 6, St. Paul said, because you are not yours, but you are belong to the Lord. We all belong to the Lord. It's not again nice verse to say that I belong to him. We are real, called to be real living members of his body. So when we think of forgiveness, or we think of not judging others, you cannot judge your another member of the body. Not reject to forgive another member of the body. That's why, as I said, maybe somewhere else yesterday, I was talking about how the church theology is Eucharistic theology based on our understanding to the Eucharist. If you are a person Believing in the power of the Eucharist, you had a communion today or on Sunday or whatever it was, it means you are accepting to be a living member of the whole body. You are able to see that the weakness of any person in the body, it's my own weakness. 
any sin it belongs to the whole body I need to pray for his or her repentance not to judge him or her that's why he's telling us here now he, Moses took the rod of God in his hand see things differently if you want to be a leader at least of all your own life let me finish with the words again of origin in his commentary on Psalm 104 it's telling us when we hear the word I'm just sharing with you a few verses about Moses to see how to be if I can get any more than that but this is what I prepared before I come when a saying of the Lord's king the imagination of a hearer of the word and makes him captivated of the wisdom that thrust into flames at the sight of any beauty then the fire of the Lord is come down upon him when we come to the church to a meeting to anything the fire of the Lord is come down upon him to make him totally different you can go home or even you can't sit in your seat at home while you are reading the word and you are still the same person why because the fire of the Lord is come down upon you this is our belief in the power of the word King Solomon says in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 4 where the word of the king is there is power and this power is for me Moses saw the burning bush on fire but it's not burned why? because he came to sanctify he came to ruin not to cut off any of the branches to prune the branches to grow more and to be more mature in this life and in the life to come may the glory of Lord Jesus Christ be with you from now and forever and ever any comments or questions any comments yes um, so you mentioned a quote earlier about how Moses talked to God face to face it's not me it's uh, oh, no, no, I know, no, it's, yeah, I was just wanted to clarify what that meant because yeah. if at all, Moses did not talk, talk to God face to face, he, yeah. he just saw his back, right? But, yeah. um, well, an, what does that mean? Yeah. Yes, it's an expression, okay, it's an expression, which, which means, you know, again, going back to Exodus chapter 34, who was in the mountain talking to God, yeah. and the Bible is telling us that he did not know that his face was shining, but the people cannot look his face that's why he was putting a cover over his forehead but they knew that he was with God it's an expression that was the intimate relationship between him and God that's why a leader is having a real intimate relationship with God not literally face to face no as, okay. yeah any other comments or questions what did Well, thanks uh, so much, uh, Buna. Well, we miss you a lot, Buna, and uh, any, you blessed us a lot tonight, and uh, we wish that you see reverence any many more times to come. Thanks, Buna. Some announcement in Ramin is gonna go over quickly. the same powers and and you you have to die for them mm. and and then um it it, it becomes gods mm. so but in the real life you die for them today and you become gods and then you you trample and fall and then you go back to your way yes so what then yes you know the Bible never told us you are going to be sinless or you will never fall. But he's asking us how to persevere. That's why we say the decision is irrevocable. It doesn't make me a sinless person. Still my choice is the same. Is my choice, if for example I feel I'm intelligent, but now I'm deceptive in any way. So I'm aware of it. So I did it now. I, I, I repented and I'm observing it after a week or 
so many days, I eat once more. Means maybe I need to fast for it. I need to consecrate some prostration for it. Why? Because I'm keen to get rid of it. Still, my decision is I'm looking for a holy divine intelligence. Mish deception. Both of them looks how to send James will a in chapter 3, there's two kinds of wisdom. One of them is satanic. And it has nothing to do with God. But it's called wisdom. It's earthly. The other one is coming from above. And then he gave us a list of how good it is. So the world still confusing us. He is wise. You never, very rare to say he's deceptive. But the Lord is telling us, see who is the source behind it. That's why when he is telling us in John 3, 6, what is born of the flesh, he is telling us, where is the source? Who gave you this wisdom? Is it your old man or the new man? Who gave you this intelligence? Old man or new man? Even when we do good things, I am giving to the poor. But again, out of pride, out of showing off, it looks nice in front of everyone. But if I will change the motive, why the Lord was praising the woman who gave the two mites? Just two mites. And many people were throwing yani, hundreds of, of dinars. Because he saw her heart and she was genuine doing something of the spirit, not of the flesh. I'm not, I have nothing, this is all what I have. I'm coming to put it in the hand of the Lord. But there is nothing wrong about falling but God is asking, are you persevering seriously? You can St. Paul in, uh, in Hebrews chapter 12. You, we have to resist sin to the point of this. This is what I'm, does mean I'm not going to be sinless, but I'm resisting to the point of this. So can I, can I just follow through? Yes. So in a life of a believer, let's, let's take a life of a, of a believer who is uh, struggling to to be, to stay godly. Many years of his life he fell and, and, and repented and is there, does God finally live? Like let's say lack of love, hate, something. Mm -hmm. So do we expect that at one point of this believer life that God will help this person and, and he will hate no more? Or is it acceptable that to the last day yes. of his life he oh, still is struggling? Two things. King David will have twice in Psalm 27 and Psalm 65. I believed that I will see your goodness on the land of the living. So he believes that he will see his goodness here. So if, does it mean that when I die, I'll be dying on a sinless status? No. But he's asking me, are you resisting sin and hating sin or taking it as something normal everyone is lying everyone is swearing everyone is judging so don't tell me this is a normal sins there is nothing called normal when he said be holy it's, I have to be holy so I'm asking myself am I resisting all of them then I'm in the right path if I'm not resisting and I think it's something part of my nature to be a liar or to be whatever then there is something seriously wrong because he's insisting to us Holiness, without which no one can see the Lord. Not to make us to fear Him, but to enjoy this. In the Tani, in Second, First Thessalonians chapter four, verse three, this is the will of God: your sanctification. That's why I'm, I am keen to be in His will, to be sanctified. Hundred percent. The choice is sanctification. Maybe I'm still failing ninety percent, but my choice is still hundred percent. Sorry.